Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today's video is a theory I have about the Psalms 83 prophecies and those involved. I perceive our ancestors' stay in Africa was the fulfillment of these prophecies and not what everyone has been saying. Please forgive me for hammering some of the same points, but I need to give you all of the information needed to vet my theory fairly. This first part is the legwork of my theory with pure African history, with me bringing it home with the Psalms 83 Arab slash Ottoman prophecies in part two. Let's begin, shall we? Quote, according to Wikipedia under slavery in Africa, quote, Systems of servitude and slavery were common in parts of the continent, as they were in much of the ancient world. In most African societies, where slavery was prevalent, the enslaved people were not treated as chattel slaves, personal property, and were given certain rights in a system similar to indigent servitude elsewhere in the world. Stop. Yes, we were slaves to the Africans before we were slaves to the cracker but it was a different type of slavery. The Deuteronomy curses did not start here, folks. It started with being taken by a stranger of fierce continents from far that spoke a language they did not comprehend. When the white man came in, he, told, he was told who the people were because he bought them from established slave runners. When he wrote his revisionary books, they named the people by the area they bought the Africans' personal slaves from. You don't believe me? I know you don't believe me. Let's continue. Quote, When the Arab slave trade and Atlantic slave trade began, many of the local slave systems changed and began supplying captives for slave markets outside of Africa. Stop. I know this is Wikipedia and some of you don't believe in Wikipedia. So let me explain why I use it. First, it is at everyone's fingertips. You don't have to go into a dungeon through cobwebs and blow the dust off of an ancient book to prove me wrong. Second, I use it personally only as a starting reference to springboard my theory research. Two heads are better than one. Remember, the cracker has knowledge it's the wisdom and understanding he lacks. Third, I'm not trying to get all deep on YouTube. Then you guys would think I'm all stuffy and wouldn't tune in. And fourth, this one is personal between Mr. Charlie and I. See, I figure if I use black sources, for the lack of a better meaning, to prove my theories, the validity of my findings, at least in his wicked ass mind, is in doubt thus allowing him to sleep at night. But if I can prove my theories and articles researched by him, written by him, edited by him, published by him, printed by him, distributed by him, or the web page by him, if he is serious about his love for white Jesus, he should be a heartbroken with insomnia. As I stated before, it's only a springboard Let's continue to springboard, shall we? Check out what they check out what they know next. I was going to say say next, but they know this. Check out what they know next. Quote: Slavery in historical Africa, and this is talking about before colonial times. Slavery in historical Africa was practiced in many different forms, and some of these do not clearly fit the definition of slavery elsewhere in the world. Debt slavery, enslavement of war captives, Military slavery and criminal slavery were all practiced in various parts of Africa. Stop. So, the African slavery system was so sophisticated, it was not practiced elsewhere in the world. Let's continue. Under subtitle, Forms of Slavery. Quote, Multiple forms of slavery and servitude have existed throughout Africa during, during history and were shaped by indigenous practices of slavery as well as the Roman institution of slavery and later Christian views on slavery, the Islamic institution of slavery, and eventually the Atlantic slave trade. Stop. So, we have at least three different institutions from three different races 
and three different religions before the cracker even was mentioned. I'm talking about the indigenous Africans, the ancient crackers, the Rome, and the sand niggas. Let's continue. Quote, slavery existed in parts of Africa like the rest of the world and was a part of the economic structure of some societies for many centuries, although the extent varied. I.B.N. Batuta, B-A-T-T-U-T-A, who visited the ancient kingdom of, of Mali in the mid-14th century, again, before Mr. Charlie, recounts that the local inhabitants vied with each other in the number of slaves and servants they had and was himself given a slave boy as a hospitality gift. In sub-Saharan Africa, the slaves' relationships were often complex, with rights and freedoms given to individuals held in slavery and restrictions on sale and treatment by their masters. Stop. Of course, the African is going to sell off his overstocked slaves. At first, greed and good old Mr. Charlie Fuckery doomed them into a system of numbers they could not keep up with. They got rid of all of the people that knew how to get things done for them. Now look at they ass. I regress. I'm figuring y'all had to get us spread out in a centralized location, if that makes any sense. So all the cracker had to do is come to different slave points and buy the slaves of Aboriginal Africans and Arabs had in stock. So our true punishment would come to pass. But let's get even deeper into this African pile of shit, shall we? Quote, many communities had hierarchies between different types of slaves. For example, di differentiating between those who had been born into slavery and those who had been captured through war. Slavery in, an Africa, slavery in African cultures were generally more like endangered servitudes. Although in certain parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, slaves were used for human sacrifices and annual ritual practices by the citizens of Dahomey, D-A-H-O-M-E-Y. Slavery, slavery were often not the chattel, which is personal property, of other men, nor enslaved for life. Stop. Again. This proves our storage in Africa was not the beginning of the Deuter Deuteronomy 28 curses. I have a theory of what really happened to our people in Africa. I would love for you to vet it for me. But that is for the end of the video. Because I need to use all the evidence we gleaned to support it. You guys are a tough crowd. I already know. Let's keep going, shall we? Quote, the forms of slavery in Africa were closely related to kinship structure. In many African communities where land could not be owned, enslavement of individuals was used as a means to increase the influence of a person increase the influence a person had and expand connections. This made slaves a permanent part of a master's lineage, and the children of slaves could become closely connected with the larger family ties. Stop. Again, we are talking about an era before the blonde-haired, blue-eyed devil needed slaves in the United Snakes of America. Two trigger phrases back to back. Watch out for the closest white person. If they have to reboot, you cannot reason with them. You cannot bargain with them. They feel no pain. They have no empathy. They have no remorse. So be on the lookout. But... Are you starting to understand the complexity of the hundreds of years we lived among the heathens before being sold to who they thought were white ghosts? Something happened. I mean, something happened to change. And I believe not being able to own us for life had something to do with it. Just like it had something to do with the worst crackers in the annals of history after they couldn't own us for life. One thing for sure. We know the history the crackers told us in school of butt-naked wild Africans warring and picking each other off just to sell to Casper for wine, pure white women, and song, trigger image, are nothing more than lies, vanities, and things of no profit. Now, I'm not saying this very thing didn't happen. In fact, 
it was prophetic and fulfilled. I'm just saying the way the cracker put it, the Africans were a bunch of, well, just think of birth of a nation, but African style. No, it didn't go down like that. Let's continue. Listen up. Quote, Children of slaves born into families could be integrated into the master's kinship group and, rate and rise to prominent positions within society, even to the level of chief in some instances. However, stigma often remain attached and there could be strict separations between slave members of a kinman group and those related to the master. Stop. Bingo. So... There were some, enough to require being referenced, that were children of slaves that excelled and became the best. Surely that had to make the master sad and his blood relatives angry and spiteful. To the point, strict separations were required. Please remember this extremely important fact. You will see it again in my summary. But wait! Under the subtitle, Local Slave Trade, quote, Several, na several nations such as the Ashante of present-day Ghana and the Yoruba of present-day Nigeria were involved in slave trading. Let me say that again for you cats and kittens out there that come in my damn comment section talking about that shit with these damn Africans. Several nations such as the Ashante of present-day Ghana and the Yoruba of present-day Nigeria were involved in slave trading. Groups such as the Amabangala, I-M-B-A-N-G-A-L-A, -A, of Angola, and the N-Y-A-M-W-E-Z-I of Tanzania, will serve as intermediaries or roving bands waging war on African states to capture people for exported slaves. Stop. Don't worry. I'm going to back this up with the Igbo thrown in for good measures. I told you guys this when I first started doing videos. The very people you are identifying with, thus proselytizing, doing a half Esau by sharing your birthright, are the very people that sold your black asses to the crackers. In fact, all you have to do is Wikipedia Yoruba people in a transatlantic slave trade and see if it doesn't say it as clear as freaking day Quote, the Yoruba people contributed a cultural and economic influence upon the Atlantic slave trade during its run from approximately 1400 to the 1900 CE. From 1400 onward, the Euro, the OYO, empire's imperial successes made the Yoruba language a lingua, lingua franca. I guess it is in French, uh, the language of France, uh, L-I-N-G-U-A, and then the second word is F-R-A-N-C-A, almost, almost to the shores of the Volta. Oyo directed more efforts towards trading and acting as middlemen for both the Trans-Saharan and Transatlantic slave trade. Stop! Calm down. The exact same thing is said when you look up the Igbo, the Ashanti, and five more nations that were the slave traders of the intercontinent slave trade people. They were not victims. Please get that out of your head. Please get that out of your head. As we read earlier, when the institution of slavery changed from the African Roman sand niggas way of things to the American cracker way of things, the close bond and delicate balance of servitude turned it into capitalistic, materialistic endeavors. The countries that did not have a slave pickup point, you know, the ones that couldn't own land so having the most slaves was flossing for them, they sold their excess slaves just like a Texan would sell his livestock. livestock. Oh, I bit my lip. To the people who knew how to how to ship slaves throughout a large era. That is the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Ashanti, etc. The middlemen tribes 
were that we just read about were the transporters of an already established sl trade slash slave routes. This is the reason they roamed the entire continent without being killed by a bigger tribe or more feasible, a combination of smaller tribes who knew they were next. Remember earlier when we went over the special kinship relationship the Africans and slaves had? You remember where a person or even a person born into slavery could rise to the top of the food chain? Well, after the Africans got a taste of that rum, saw how guns could kill their enemies, and when he got a hold of some of that sweet polypure bread, those Africans lost their minds and started selling off everything they could, including their old form of wealth, their slaves, for the new form of wealth and prestige a white she-devil, booze, and a gun to kill yourself. Man, classic evil genius. There's nothing new under the sun, huh? Well, according to the Low Country Digital History Initiative under Slavery in West and Central Africa, listen up, keep in mind, the nations are under the same spell of ignorance as Mr. Charlie. Things that are as plain as day escapes them, meaning they, too, are under the modern illusion all the people in Africa was African. For this reason, we must listen to what they say, and just as important, what they don't say. Quote, and keep in mind that, we're, that's in the second part, the part that they don't say, and everything that we've read thus far, is going to blow your mind. But let's, let's, keep, let's keep going. Quote, Slavery was prevalent in many West and Central African societies before and during the transatlantic slave trade, when diverse African empires, small to medium-sized nations, or kinship groups came into conflict with, for various political and economic reasons, individuals from one African group regularly enslaved captives from other groups because they viewed them as outsiders. Stop. Bingo. And just what I said happened all along. Because the slavery was never permanent and the desired status was to be either a homeborn or kinship to a homeborn, that means there were many that didn't make, either make the cut or wanted to be on their own. Surely these people created their own autonomous communities. If they were smart, right on the outskirts of the established order. If there is nothing new under the sun, and if we were stiff-necked, iron sunu with brazen foreheads to our God, just imagine how we were to the Africans. And we all know what a colored would do to a cat that looks like him. It's the dogs they seem to have a problem standing up to. Surely if the squabble is political, economics is the seed of discourse. They go hand in hand. And as we just read, the Africans settled the problem by enslaving slash servitude, the smaller problem. A bloodless war and amalgamation in one swoop. How do I know I'm on the right page? Because it says they did things this way without regret or remorse because they viewed them as outsiders. Which can only mean one of the party in question is not from around those parts. If you know what I mean. Just in case you didn't believe the information just given before, here's a short summary to back it up. Let's continue, shall we? Quote, West and Central Africans elites and royalty from slave-holding societies even relied on their kinship groups, us, ranging from family members to slaves, to, to secure and maintain their wealth and status. By controlling the rights of their kinship groups, us, Western and Central African elites own the products of their labor. In contrast, before the transatlantic slave trade, Western European elites focused on owning land as private property to secure their wealth. They held rights to the products produced on their land through various labor systems rather than owning the labor as chattel property. Stop. Wait. If I look at that last part with an analytical eye, I can deduce 
when I get to the least common denominator, mind you, the cracker learned how to use slaves for labor equals wealth from the Africans. Or maybe it was someone else. And I am leaning towards the someone else part. Part two. Remember this part. I will explain later. Hearing this also cements my understanding of the Africans sold off their excess slaves, but went too far and sold off all the people who know how to get things done. Do you really think the cracker taught us how to do anything? Hell no. We came here knowing what to do and already had immunity to the conditions. What? You think that was a coincidence too? This can only mean the crackers knew exactly who they were getting. In fact, sneak peek into my summary. I believe they knew exactly where to find us and specifically asked for us, or should I say, bought us from a middleman. And it ain't who you think. Through the scriptures, and it's not the Psalms 83. Though our entire Middle East series is dealing with those exact same nations. But that's for the summary. But did you notice the same sentiment echoed of the delicate balance of African to outsider before the cracker? I'm going to cut this reference off here because I want to shift your attention to the Encyclopedia Britannica and see what it has to say about the situation. Remember when the earlier reference material said certain specific African tribes were known to roam the landscape and war against the people to snatch slaves? Remember when I said I think that was a big lie and those tribes were the intercontinent slave transporters? Check this out. Under African intercontinent slave trade, quote, beginning in the late 16th century, the ARO, the A-R-O, built a complex network of alliances and treaties with many of the Igbo clans. They served as arbiter, arbiter, arbiters, A-R-B-I-T-E-R-S, in villages throughout the Igbo land. And their famous oracle at A-R-O-C-H-U-K-W-U, -U, located in a thickly wooded gorge, was widely regarded as a court of appeal for many kinds of disputes. By custom, the ARO, A-R-O, were sacrosanct, S-A-C-R-O-S-A-N-C-T. According to Google, sacrosanct means especially of a principle, place, or routine, regarded as too important or valuable to be interfered with, impeachable, untouchable, inalienable. Let's keep going. So we know who these people were. They, were, they weren't to be touched with. They were, wasn't to be touched throughout all freaking Igbo land and thus Africa. But let's continue. Quote, by custom, the Aro were sacrament, allowing them to travel anywhere with their goods without fear of attack. Alliances with certain Igbo clans who acted as mercenaries for the Aru guaranteed their safety. As oracle priests, they also received slaves as payment of fines or dedicated to the gods by their masters as scapegoats for their own transgressions. These slaves thereby became the property of the arrow priests who were at liberty to sell them. Stop! Are you smelling what the old scribe is cooking? These cats weren't making war with people. They were being protected by the intercontinent slave traders to move their product, plain and simple. There were no bloody wars at, and such at that time in history in the African people. How do I know? Because like most people my age, I watched the movie Shaka Zulu, and he was born in 1787. I remember the moment the light bulb went off for me when I'm watching the movie. You know when I realized the Africans had bloodless wars before the heathen crackers gave him the modern weapons and created the bloodlust that followed. I remember the scene all too well. The tribes were positioning themselves on the grassy hill. It was, it was though whoever could get the best position won. But not Shaka after being possessed with the white man's spirit of war. Shaka ran up to the man and stabbed the shit out of him. Nobody knew what the hell he was doing. 
that changed my viewpoint on the Africans for life. I still hate them, but I knew they were not the savages the cracker wanted me to believe. That's before they were infected by the white devil disease, that is. And everybody on the face of the planet know, once you go white, there will always be blight. Nothing for you will ever go right. You will forever have to fight, but never have true might until you finally see the light and learn how to bite. And I mean really, really tight. And tell him to go fly a kite. But that's only if you might lose sight and fuck up and go white. Now, to prove to you the sheer number of slaves, the very people you forced your birthright on were slave runners and their land was chuck full of slaves before the cracker? Well, check this. Did you notice when I said you force your birthright? I said it like that because those people don't give a damn about you and will tell you to your face you are not his brother. That's when his wicked ass isn't trying to fleece you, mind you. But anyway, let's continue. Quote, in Senegambia, S-E-N-E, G-A-M-B-A-A, -A, between 1300 and 1900, close, listen to this, people, listen to this. Here's the proof, L listen to this. <laughs> listen to this. Between 1300 and 1900, close to one-third of the population was enslaved. In Islamic states of the Western Sudan, including Ghana, Mali, Signu, which is S-E-G-O-U, and Sangai, S-O-N-G-H-A-I, about a third of the population were enslaved. In Sierra Leone, in the 19th century, about a half of the population consisted of enslaved people. In the 19th century, at least half of the population was enslaved among the Dula, D-U-A-L-A, of the Cameroon, and other peoples of the Lower Niger, the Congo, and the... K-A-S-A-N-G-J-E, Kingdom, and C-H-O-K-W-E of Angola. Among the Ashanti and Yoruba, a third of the population consisted of enslaved people. The population of the Sokoto, Kalefe, formed by H-A-U-S-A-S, in northern Nigeria and Cameroon, was half enslaved in the 19th century, it is estimated that up to 90%, 90% of the population of Arab Swahili Zanzibar was enslaved. Roughly half of the population of Madagascar was enslaved. Example. So as you can see, all the evildoers had to do from this point is to say black is black and whatever pickup point they had the slaves from. They labeled them by the tribe that they picked them up, the people from. Not that we were from that tribe. You get that? Okay. I think I gotta stop there. That's part one. Part two is gonna be the doozy. Bringing it home. How Psalms 83 comes into play. Joel 3 comes into play. Uh, and there's another prophecy in there too, comes into play. All right, see that? That's 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 an Arab. That's who who was uh, with us and enslaving us before the cracker even got there. All right, here we go. Thank you for looking at this part. I know I struggle. Look for the next.